world, this is the Fan and Fanatic Podcast. I'm Parker Gerlecki, a.k.a. the Fan and Fanatic, and with me as always is my broadcast partner, Dad, a.k.a. Ryan Gerlecki. I've got a passion for all things sports. So, on the Fan and Fanatic Podcast, we'll talk to anyone and everyone from all over the world of sports who will sit still long enough to answer my questions. That's right. Now, as a result of complications from severe brain damage at birth, unfortunately, Parker will never be able to physically play sports. But that cannot and has never stopped him from loving everything about sports and dreaming of a career in broadcasting. So each of our guests graciously gives of their time on this podcast to invest in Parker's dream and to help him be part of the sports world he loves so dearly. Now, let's... Label. Welcome back, fanatic addicts. I would like to introduce you to, bleh, introduce you to Mr. Stedman Sheely. All right, Stedman, why don't you tell everyone who you are, where you're from, and your connection to the sports world? My name's Stedman Sheely, and I grew up in Dothan, Alabama. And I played football for the University of Alabama, Coach Bryant. And we were fortunate enough to be national champions in 1978 and 79. Very interesting. What do you do now? I'm an attorney. I've been practicing law for almost 40 years uh, all over the state of Alabama. I'm a litigator. My father is an attorney, actually. Yes, I am. Great. And a litigator. (laughs) Oh, well, I was speaking, right. speaking of litigator, hey, Dad, you know what you call a Florida fan that that studies law? Not smart. A litigator. Hey, oh, uh, get it, it. get it, litigator, litig, like emphasis on the gator, because you know. Sorry, you have sorry. to explain it. It ain't funny. Anyway, so I went to uh, let me let me follow up on that because I went to law school at Florida State University. And we had a lot of people who, who would do their undergrad at the University of Florida and then come to law school at Florida State. And they actually had their own little group. And it was called the litigators to uh, maintain their identity in Tallahassee. Mr. All Stedman, right. it just so happens that we have a, mu- a mutual friend who connected us. We do. Yes. J.W. Hodge. Yes, he's a friend. He's a good friend of mine. He's a great guy. And we call him the barefoot punter. He, it also happens that he's made several appearances on the Paul Feinbaum show. You know, do you know who Paul Feinbaum is? I do. He's a personal friend of mine, too. Great. Anywho, en- enough about those people. We're here to talk about you. So what took you to Alabama? Well, you know, all the Sheelys had graduated from Alabama, and uh, but really the Lord did. I spent a day in prayer asking God, where do you want me to go? Because Alabama had signed the top five quarterbacks in the state the year before. So if you look at it from a playing standpoint, it didn't look as good. And one of them was Jeff Rutledge, who was, you know, an outstanding quarterback and went on and played in the pros. But it was really the Lord that directed me. Uh, And what's interesting is I'll never forget I had uh, Doug Barfield, Auburn's head coach, in my living room. Vince Dooley, Georgia's head coach, outside, and Coach Bryant called. And I'll never forget, and I went in there, my mother got me in. The first thing Coach Bryant said was, Stebman, what jersey have you always wanted to wear? <laughs> and, of course, I mumbled around, said the crimson. And he goes, well, what's your problem then? He said, if you'll commit, I'll come down and personally sign you. Well, I didn't no commit, way. but I did pray. And Coach Bryant did, and God led me to Alabama, and Coach Bryant came down and personally signed me. And back then, you know, he didn't do but a couple of people a year. Wow. And it also happens that you hosted Coach Bryant's weekly radio show. Am I, Is that right? Well, it was this TV show. It yeah, was weekly called the, TV was, show. Yeah, it was called The Bear Bryant Show. And I, I hosted it as last year. I was a 24-year-old kid who was also coaching while I went to law school. Uh, and I, if you look at 315, I don't know if you've ever, maybe you can Google it, but that's when Coach Bryant broke the record. But I'm the guy right beside him with headphones. 
I had the most powerful non-paying job in America. <laughs> so were you part, was this like, I know that like most, most coaches shows nowadays, like for college coaches are hosted by the voice of the school in which the, the like the voice of the sport of the school in which the coach coaches, like, you know what I mean? Right. So well, did, back then that wasn't the case. Charlie Thornton had co-hosted his show for like 24 years. And then he left, and then I was, you know, a graduate assistant coach, and Coach Bryant came to me and said, hey, I want you to co-host a show with me. And I said, okay. I didn't know what I was doing or anything, but it was a great time because back then, the Coach Bryant show was an hour long, and it was one of the most watched TV shows in the whole state of Alabama because, you know, we could only be on on. TV twice one year and then three times the next year. So you're real limited. So people love to watch the, you know, the, the coach Bryant show. And, uh, I'll never forget the, about midway in the season, we lost to Southern Miss and coach Bryant walked in. We were in Birmingham. That's where we'd film it. And he goes, Stedman, I'm going to retire. He said, you know, letting Reggie Carrier beat us running the ball was just, I, I'm, I'm losing my edge and I think it's time to retire. So I had to kind of gather myself, hmm. but I was probably the first person to know that coach Bryant was going to retire. Wow. So you were never part of the Crimson Tide sports network. Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. Cause like nowadays the radio network crew do, ho host the coaches shows. Like I pointed out before. They do. They sure do. So like Eli Gold or, you know, Roger Hoover or sorry, sorry. Like I said, OK, so do you remember the feeling when you won the national championship? Like what was rushing through the mind of Stedman Shealy? Well, I mean, it was we went that was my senior year and uh, we went 12 and 0. We were undefeated. Mm -hmm. We played Arkansas in the Sugar Bowl. Lou Holtz was their coach and. It was just, you know, what a blessing uh, to have a perfect season, to be number one in the country. And, you know, that's what we all aspire to be. And I was just so thankful to the Lord for giving me the opportunity to, you know, to be a part of greatness. And uh, it was just great. But then right after that, I, I, <laughs> in full disclosure, is I was thinking, OK, what am I going to do now? <laughs> so uh, that that's my makeup, you know, and and, and I guess being a, a Bryant pupil, you know, he would he's always would teach and preach and, and harp on, you know, getting better every day. And you prepare for the rest of your life and everything you do today is going to make a difference tomorrow. And so it was really neat. So you obviously know who Eli Gold is, right? I do. The, vo I sure do. the voice of Alabama sports. Yes. Was he the voice of the Crimson Tide during your tenure at Alabama or no? He was not. Who was that it? Tells, that tells you how Doug, uh, <laughs> well, Doug Layton was a color guy. And then John Forney was the uh, voice of the Crimson Tide. So John Forney was the Eli Gold before Eli Gold. Is that correct. what I'm understanding? Yes, I believe that's correct. So what was the greatest lesson that you learned from Coach Paul Bear Bryant? Um, never being satisfied with where you are. You know, one of the big things towards Coach Bryant's end of his career while I was coaching with him, he, he, he said, you know, I never want to go back to plowing. And Coach Bryant was always trying to get better every day. And um, you just uh, – you know, he would say, you know, you may be getting knocked around the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, but you got to own the fourth quarter. And uh, he just always believed in, you know, getting better every day. I'm sorry. What did you say? Go back to plowing? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, that's right. Coach, you got to remember, Coach Bryant grew up very poor and he did a lot of plowing. So and, like uh, snow plowing. Fort Dice. No, no, no. Oh, the field, plowing man. with a mule. Oh, I'm so dumb. I'm sorry. The only no, plowing I've ever no, heard not. of is snow plowing. <laughs> no, well, this is called plowing with a mule. Um, and it's hot and it's hard work. Uh, Father, do you have yeah. a question? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that a little bit. Um, 
So uh, I think and I believe playing sports is, is just a, a great way to learn so many lessons for life, regardless of what you end up doing. So I'd be curious, you know, you mentioned that you practice law, you've been a lawyer for many years now. How has the lessons learned through Coach Bryant playing football for him helped you or impacted your career as a lawyer? Well, you just you learned to outwork everybody. Uh, mm. You know, that was Coach Bryant taught a work ethic. And I mean, I had a pretty strong work ethic before I went to Alabama, but he uh, he intensified it. And that same work ethic that I've used as a lawyer, uh, hmm. you know, if you outwork everybody, most of the time you get real good results. That's good. Interesting. So out of all your experiences, what was your greatest moment or memory? Uh, probably it was uh, my senior year. We were playing Auburn. We were up 17 to three at half, came out the second half. We fumbled, I don't know, four times during the fourth quarter. I mean, third quarter. And next thing you know, uh, we are behind 18 to 17. And then Coach Bryant, only Coach Bryant would do this. He benched the first team offense <laughs> and he put in the second unit. We were really units. And, um, and they went three and out. He put us back in with about 12 minutes left in the game, and we marched at 82 yards, and I was able to score the winning touchdown and the two-point conversion, and we went on and won the ball game. And it wow. just so happens that my mother is an Auburn fan. Her her whole family has been tailgating there since, I don't know, the the prob- was it before the Punt-Bama punt day? But, but was it the Punt-Bama punt era or – Way after that. I don't think your mother's that old. My oh, no, no, no. My, grand, my grandparents. Oh, your grandparents. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It'd be your, Sorry. You're probably, I, I, could, yeah, I should have been more clear right. on that. My bad. No, I think you were clear. I wasn't. Um, were fine. you on the team during the Punt Bama Punt game, or was that no, way, way, way no, after that's, you Well, no, that's way before my team. Oh, that's so that was in, like 1960-something. No, it was 1972, hmm. I believe. Yeah, 1972. That's right. But I'll I never forget, I was, uh, yeah, I was shooting basketball, listening to the game on the radio, and I couldn't believe it. I was devastated. Yeah, I remember reading about it in one of the books I have, or magazines, I guess. So, do you still go to Alabama games? I do. Do you? I, I, yeah, I oh. have a home in Tuscaloosa. Ah. So, I'm, I'm up there a lot, go to a lot of the, you know, normally the big games, but, uh, but yeah, I'm. I'm still a part of it. Do you have a favorite tradition at Alabama? Uh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, not really. I, I wouldn't say there's any one tradition. You know, I do such a variety of things on game day. You know, if I'm going to the game, uh, I guess my tradition is I walk in right at kickoff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just when you're a father of five and you got eight grandkids and everything else, you, you know, there's a lot going on in your life. So, um, I'm going to tell a quick story. As I said before, my mom's whole side of the family are Auburn fans and, but they're from Georgia. So as you can imagine, they're, um, they're, they're, they're more they're, like, they're okay with Alabama, but they just, they, you know, they can't stand Georgia. Cause you know, being from Georgia, Growing up with friends who all of them are jo- anywho, like I, I have this, I, like I have this goal for myself to visit as many stadiums as I can before I, you know, go up to heaven. So I was fortunate enough to go to the Alabama versus Texas A and M game last year. Well, which so one of my grandfather's clients slash friends is a Texas A and M fan, and he got tickets to the game, and he got and he gave us those tickets. Anywho, so my me. My grandfather, my grandmother, my and my brother, we we all we all went down to Tuscaloosa for the game, and let me tell, and it was so fun. Like I, the one thing I was hoping to do while we were there is to meet the is to meet the the pachyderm of the hour, Mister Big Al. So we went to Elephant. So we went to Elephant Stomp. You know that big like little you know that little pep rally they have like outside that little like those one of, one of those little like frat houses in Tuscaloosa, Elephant Stomp. Right. Anywho, That's right. And 
it, and the people in front of me like let me like cut in front of them so I could so so I I did I I, I took several pictures so then it was so then f- fast forward to the beginning of the game like ab- about no not the beginning of the game like about like mid pregame festivities the the million dollar band was about to do their thing and all of a sudden I see Big Al in a like come out in a drum major uniform. And I'm like, oh, that is the cutest thing in the world. We need more <laughs> ma- mascot drum majors. So, which brings me to this question. What do you? What is your opinion on Big Al's pregame drum major routine? Do you like it? <laughs> yeah, I think it's great. I think it just adds to the flavor of the game and the day and the festivities. And, you know, that's just a part of it. So you obviously know who Tony Giles is, don't you? I the, do. The voice of Bryant Denny Stadium. First, may I give you? My, I'm going to give you my impression of him, if you don't mind. Hey, great. Jalen Milrose pass to pass complete to Jalen Waddle for a first down, Alabama. That's perfect. J- Sounds great. Jalen Milrose pass to Jalen Waddle complete for a touchdown, Alabama. That's even better. Joseph Bullock is out. <laughs> Joseph Bullock is out to kick a field goal. The kick is up. It's good. Joseph Bullock is up for the extra point. It's up. It's good. Okay. Anyhow, sorry. I, I just wanted to get that out the way. Okay. So, yeah. Back to you. What is your favorite stadium that you visited as a fan? Uh, Kyle Phil. Hmm. What about your that's favorite where, stadium that you played? That's where A and M plays. Uh. Yep. That's where Texas yep. A&M, everybody needs to go to Calfield once and just see the festivities. Home of the Junction Boys. See what, yeah, see what goes on. And it's just a great experience. And it just so happens that one of our previous guests, Audie Stein, do you know who that is? I know of him. So, yeah, he was one of, he was one of Coach Bear Bryant's Junction Boys at A&M. No, he wasn't. No, not, it was not. Not no, Coach Bryant. Coach that he, the coach that he worked with was. Oh, the coach that he worked with was one of the Junction Boys, and then your fa- and then your favorite stadium that you got to, that you've gotten to play in, like for for either a, 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 the conference championship, the bowl, a bowl game, or a new or a like a road game. I would say uh, New Orleans is. You know, we played in three straight Sugar Bowls, but I love the atmosphere and uh, down in New Orleans at the Sugar Bowl. Hmm. So, do you have a sporting event that is on your bucket list of sporting events to attend that you haven't yet attended? Uh, you're going to think it's crazy. I've always said I wanted to go to the U.S. Open tennis. But I just hadn't done it. Very cool. Very cool. So, any other stories you think our listeners would want to know? Uh, yeah, there's... um. You know, the the neat thing about Coach Bryant is he not only prepared you for a national championship or to play, but he also prepared you for life. And he was the best at, you know, sharing stories and getting us ready. And and so many things we went through, he would uh, just, you know, take it a step further and say, you know, what are you going to do when? You walk in to work and you got a pink slip on your desk. Then you go by the bank to, you know, see how much money you got in there. And your wife's taking all your money out of the bank. And (laughs) as you're driving home, feeling sorry for yourself, you see smoke coming up and you realize your home's on fire. He -hmm. says, what are you going to do? You're going to quit or are you going to do whatever it takes and pull yourself up and, and, uh, and overcome you know, adversity. Hmm. And then the other thing that's so neat about Coach Ryan is one day we were coming out of staff meeting and Coach Ryan and I were talking and he goes, Stedman, I, you may not realize this, but I bet you I pray more than you do. He said, because there's never a time that I don't see somebody less fortunate than me that I don't pray for them. Hmm. And that's kind of a neat side of Coach Ryan that, you know, most people don't know. And uh, he was just, he was something else, and uh, he was tough, and I mean, he really tough. But you know, once you proved you were a winner, I mean, he was great. And you know, we'd have such neat times taking he all every week. He'd say, "I want to take a walk with the quarterbacks," and then he'd tell his <laughs> stories, and it was just, just a lot of fun. Uh, 
That's awesome. We've been able to hear from a number of folks who were around him. Um, and all these stories are, are so consistent and so cool. But, you know, be, it, not growing up an Alabama fan, you know, obviously not having played there, played for him. We, you don't hear a lot of this stuff. And it's it's very, very cool to hear about coaches like that. And you, you don't see that as much in uh, in coaching anymore. And I don't know if it's the coaches have changed or the game has changed, but uh, it's very cool to hear that that that's, that story, that sentiment is consistent with uh, a man and a coach like him. I actually and have just, another. Oh, go ahead. You you finish. Right, hang on. Let me tell you one more quick story. It was not unusual for Coach Bryant to slip up to Birmingham and go see somebody, you know, go up the back stairs or whatever and go into a room and sign an autograph. And, you know, somebody that was maybe very sick, had cancer, was dying. And I mean, there's so many things Coach Bryant would do that people, you know, they had no idea. And he would intercede for his players, and, uh, you know, he was just amazing. But on the flip side, if you didn't do right, then you were going to pay the consequences. But I think he understood that, you know, you, you've got to do right in life. And if you break the rules and you don't do what you're supposed to do, then you're going to pay the consequences. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hmm. So I have another really quick story. A few years ago, I got to do an event with the Falcons, and I and I ran into John Parker Wilson, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Was it at the event? Cause, and, like, uh, you know, me being a young, clueless Auburn fan, not knowing that he went to Alabama. You were, like, four years old, too. You were, like, four years old, and you did know he went to Alabama <laughs> because we told you. Hey, 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 can I, can I, can, all right, let me think. Okay, okay, okay. And anywho, so... I, I go up to him and I say, War Eagle. And then he says, man, that's one of the harshest insults I've ever heard. <laughs> or is that right? Were those his yeah. words? Well, yeah, because that and how the story went, you were only about four. So really young. We're, it's like a red carpet sort of thing with the Falcons. And there he is. And we're like, oh, Parker, this is, this is John Parker Wilson. He played football. He was a quarterback at Alabama. And your response to that was to say to him, War Eagle. Wait. <laughs> that's. Come on, Parker. What's going on? Wait, was Julio Jones on the on the team at the time? No, he was not. No, no, no. I mean the Falcons, not Alabama. That's what I just said. No, he was not. I know okay. what you're talking about. Because yeah, it would be so cool to get like either of those guys on the podcast. On this podcast, we are all sports fanatics. So the last question we ask as a fan: What do you think is the all time greatest moment in sports? I don't know. I, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is Michael Jordan, you know, playing him mm. for the Bulls and some of the unbelievable things he did. I don't know why that comes to mind. Uh, I mean, good that answer. was incredible. Good answer. Good answer. That is a good answer. Um, Thank you so much, Mr. Stedman Sheely. All right, fanatics. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Fan and Fanatic. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for all of your support. Don't forget to follow or subscribe, or whatever your podcast app says to do. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. For my broadcast partner, Brian Grilecki, this is Parker Grilecki saying, Game, Set, Match! Match!